Welcome and thank you very much for coming, all the keynote speakers of this conference. Associate Professor Peter Sayer from the Ohio State University. Associate Professor Ai Chun Yen from the National Tonghua University, Taiwan. Dr. Ramiza Darmi, Universitas Putra Malaysia. Dr. Aguma Wangjati, Institut Teknologi Bandung. Dr. Nur Arifa Drajati, MPD. Universitas 11 Maret, Surakarta. Dr. Phil Khairun Niam, The State Islamic University of Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. Dr. Irma Soraya, MPD, from the State Islamic University of Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. The Honorable, all audiences and the participants, both in the Zoom and on us on site. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of community members, we would like to welcome back all of you to the third international conference on English language teaching iCanal 2022 in Uyen Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. Today is your second day participating in iCanal 2022, and we wish we wish you all the enjoy the event and please don't get Zoom fatigue for those of you who join this online event. I believe you have learned a lot of things from the seven keynote speakers from the different universities. Before we start this event, let us pray in accordance with trust. May God make this rewarding event for all of us and the event will run smoothly and conducive. Let us pray and by resetting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It is great honor. My name is Alia Nabila, as Master of Ceremony, and I represent of students of English language education departments. Dear audiences, those are the agenda we have presented to all of you this morning on behalf of community members we also thank you for the remarkable support from national Tonghua university and our partner journals indonesian journal of open education or igee okara nobel indonesian journal of english teaching or ijet pioneer journal panyonara english Education Journal, Ealing Journal, Foster Journal, Fost Foster Journal, Elite Journal, Bastra, Journal of Language Intelligence and Culture, University of NU Surabaya, Bank Tabungan Negara, Nitiasa. Ladies and gentlemen, and all the participants of ICANA 2022. Now we are going to the first session, the discussions of the Professor Peter Sayer from Ohio University with the theme, Teaching and Researching Trans Languaging in EFL Context, Possibilities and the Challenges. To lead the next session, we would like to invite Ibu Afida Safriani, PhD, to moderate the first keynote speaker. All right, I would like to say thank you very much again to all the audiences and the participants on the Zoom. The last I say, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please welcome Ibu Fitria Safriani, PhD. Afida, Afida ya. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hey, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Iconel Day Two. Um, we really appreciate that everybody uh, attend the morning session, and we would like to have Dr. Sayer, Dr. Peter Sayer, to be our presenter today. So again, thank you for being on time, and we really appreciate that. My name is Afida Safriani. 
uh, this morning, I'm going to serve to be the moderator for Dr. Peter Sayer, who's going to talk about um, researching and teaching translanguaging in EFL context, possibilities and challenges. Uh, please allow me to introduce our wonderful speaker. Uh, Dr. Peter Sayer is a professor of multilingual language education at the Ohio State University. He holds a PhD in educational linguistic from Arizona State University. He is the author of over 50 research articles and books in the area of social linguistics and language teaching. He is also the co-director co of the Buckeye Language Education Research Center, the past general editor of TESOR Journal, and a former Fulbright Scholar to Mexico. Last but not least, Dr. Sayer is one of my inspiring professor when I was a student at the Ohio State University. Hello, Dr. Sayer, can you hear us? Yes, I, just I can want to hear double you check fine. that you, you are with us and you Tapiani. can hear us. Can you hear me okay? Uh, it's a little. Are you, are you hearing yeah, me? Probably Fida? the volume is a little low. Hello, Fida? Please allow us to check with the. I'm hearing you. Is oh, everyone hearing yes, me? Yes, yes. Now it's very uh, clear. I'm on the Zoom and I can hear you fine. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Taylor. Thank you. Yes, we can uh, hear you I'm now. I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Safiani, if, uh, if the people in the audience are able to hear us on the Zoom, but the other Zoom participants say they can hear me. Oh, okay. So please allow us to address this technical issue. But yes, here uh, in the amphitheater, we can hear you very clearly. And can you hear us too? Can you hear me, Dr. Sayer? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Dr. Safiani. I'm hearing you fine. Okay, thank you. So please allow me to continue. Um, so some of you might have heard the term translanguaging for the first time, or some of you might have heard the, uh, the term translanguaging before, or some of you might have been practicing translanguaging in your English classroom. Um, so the use of students' first language has been a prolonged debate, whether you can use it in your English classroom or not. And if you have use the first language, the student first language in your English classroom, uh, to what extent can you use that? And if you haven't used the student's first language in your English classroom, why not? Yeah. So um, today in this talk, Dr. Sayer will explain the theoretical foundations of translanguaging and the new models for translanguaging pedagogy. More importantly, Dr. Sayer will explore some advantages of translanguaging, yeah? Some advantages translanguaging may offer for English learners in Indonesian context, uh, especially in terms of cognitive affordances and L2 identity development. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Peter Sayers. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Safiani, Peter. Um, it's a, really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can everyone see the screen okay now? Okay, great. Well, yes. um, thank you so much to the organizers of uh, ICONELT 2022. I'm really uh, happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all, um, and especially thank you to, to you, Fida, for um, making the connection and facilitating the invitation. So. Um, Thank you everyone for your interest in this topic. As uh, Fida mentioned, um, yeah, this is, is something that I've been working on for a number of years now, this idea of translanguaging. Um, and nowadays we're trying to extend this idea of translanguaging from, from certain contexts in, of bilingual education in the US to think about how can we apply this idea to different EFL contexts like the one that you guys have in Indonesia. So I'm not sure if I have any um, definite answers for you because, of course, you know the Indonesian context much better than I do. I can't tell you, um, you know, what the potential uh, uh, implications or applications of translanguaging might be in Indonesia. But what I'd like to do then, um, as Fida mentioned, is um, to engage with this question of um, really what is the appropriate use of uh, students' first language or languages um, in the TESOL classroom. Um, and so what I'd like to do is uh, start by uh, giving you a, a definition and a bit of the theoretical background of translanguaging, 
and then talk in particular about how translanguaging has been developed into a pedagogical model, and then revisit that question, right? If, if we are going to um, embrace uh, translanguaging, um, how can we do that in, in, in EFL contexts? Um, so that's the outline of my talk. Um, and uh, Dr. Safiani, if you can let me know, um, hopefully I, I, I'll, I'll be okay with the time, but I know there were some technical issues and you might need to adjust the time. So, so please let me know. Um, uh, if, uh, you know, if I need to uh, adjust the time here. Um, but let's start with this, this question then. Um, and so I'm gonna go through that and then hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q and A um, at the end as well. I'd be very interested to hear about your ideas, your questions, um, for those of you that have been trying translanguaging in your classrooms, you know, what, what, have, you been, um, what have you been experiencing? So let me start with this question then. What is the role of the L1 in TESOL classroom? And um, for those of you who were trained in TESOL, I was trained in sort of the, the, the 1990s and 2000s, um, and I was trained in what's called the, uh, the use of the 90% rule. The 90% rule, may, maybe some of you are familiar with, the idea that you need to use at least 90% of the time, you need to be using the target language, right? And the idea there is that you need to be able to maximize the student's exposure and therefore, of course, the, the amount of comprehensible input that the students are receiving, right? And so the idea is that you want to make the classroom as close as possible to a monolingual immersion environment in the target language. So maybe not 100%, you couldn't be perfect about it, but at least 90%, as close as you can get, right? And so that was kind of the, the prevailing idea for, for many, many years, is that um, you, know, you only use the L1 if you absolutely have to, um, but uh, generally you need to try to use um, the target language, in this case, English, in the case of TESOL, of course, um, as much as possible. But about 10 years ago, um, some scholars in applied linguistics, they started kind of challenging that idea or, or asking us at least to rethink this idea. And, um, and this is when Ophelia Garcia, who's um, a, uh, a scholar who works at uh, New York University, um, she took this idea of translanguaging and she kind of proposed it in bilingual education settings in the United States. This is mostly bilingual education settings for Latino students who speak um, Spanish as their first language. So that's um, many of the, the bilingual um, contexts here in the US. And she said that we should think about translanguaging as, this is um, a modification of her definition, the definition of the multiple discursive practices in which bilinguals engaged based on their full linguistic repertoire in order to make sense of their bilingual worlds. So this was her definition. And that kind of got a lot of people um, excited about you know, the pr prospects of, of, of um, adopting this idea of translanguaging. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind then. Translanguaging, first of all, it comes from bilingual education um, and was sort of now starting to be adopted into TESOL, right? But it's based on this idea then that TESOL classrooms are by definition multilingual spaces, right? By definition, we have students who are trying to become uh, bilingual or multilingual with English, right? And so we can think of TESOL then as really an extension of multilingual education. And that's an important distinction, right? Because again, as I said, a lot of times the, the traditional notion is that we're trying to sort of approach this through a monolingual lens. We have to use English almost exclusively, right? Now it causes us to rethink that a little bit. And in fact, Garcia wasn't, I mean, Garcia was the, the, the first one to sort of um, bring our attention to this idea of translanguaging and give us a, a very strong definition for it. But in fact, these ideas, even before Garcia, these ideas had started um, kind of percolating or these ideas had been around um, a little bit. Um, and so you can see that translanguaging really is an extension of a, um, a notion that Lourdes, Gar uh, Lourdes Ortega, who's a, um, a big name in the field of SLA or second language acquisition, um, she talked about a bilingual or multilingual turn in second language acquisition. Um, and this is connected to other work too. Um, David Block, who talks about the social turn, Stephen May, who talked about the multilingual turn, and others, right? And so it's it's kind of this part of this movement in second language acquisition, in um, applied linguistics, and in TESOL around um, you know rethinking um, how we're approaching languages and languaging and um, the relationship between languages within the classroom, right? 
Um, and so, again, if we think about translanguaging then and what it's sort of challenging the, this, this monolingual premise, right? And so translanguaging in that sense, Garcia and others would argue, offers a, um, a counter narrative to conventional multilingual teaching approaches. And you see these two pictures here. I don't know if you have banyan trees in um, Indonesia, but maybe you're familiar with them. They're these trees that, um, it's one tree, but if you look at it very carefully, it's actually many, many trees kind of all woven together to form one tree, right? And Garcia says that metaphor of the banyan tree, that's how we should think about students' multilingualism, right? It's not the matter that they have, you know, these separate languages, but rather they have all of their languages together. That's what she means by the student's full linguistic repertoire. She says that's how we should think about multilingualism, not like a, you know, a bicycle, right? That's kind of how she says, traditionally we think about, um, in TESOL, we think about um, bilingualism as two separate wheels on the bicycle. She says, no, bilingualism isn't a bicycle, it's more like a banyan tree. Why? Because a bilingual person is not a double monolingual, right? A bilingual person is, there's not a, like a perfectly balanced bilingual, right? We know that bilinguals, you know, they're stronger in certain uh, areas in one language or the other language, or they use the language in their daily life, you know, one language to do something and the other language to do something else. And I know that you guys know this very well in, in, in the Indonesian context, where you have many, many, Indonesia is one of the places in the world with the highest um, linguistic diversity in the whole planet, right? You know that there's lots of local languages that people use for certain things, there's uh, Bahasa Indonesia, the, the national language that you use for other things, and then there's English or other international languages that you use for other things, right? And so again, um, you know that that sort of this idea of translanguaging kind of reflects how people use their various languages in their everyday lives in Indonesia and in many, many places in the world, right? And so what Garcia says is that one of the most important challenges for bilingual education, and I would also add TESOL today, is to ensure that languages do not compete with each other, but that they are developed and used in a functional interrelationship. Maybe you guys have heard of ideas like diglossia and people that work in sociolinguistics who look at kind of how languages tend to complement each other. I said that in Indonesia, probably they use the local languages, the national language and in global languages for different site, site for different purposes, right? And those purposes complement each other. They're not in competition. That's what Garcia is talking about here, is that thinking about within the sort of micro context of a language classroom, how can we do the same thing? How can languages be sort of in a healthy, functional interrelationship with each other? And so that's kind of our question, then, right? How can translanguaging contribute to a productive, functional interrelationship between languages in the TESOL classroom? And um, my colleague Zhang Fenqian and others have thought about this through what they call a translanguaging lens for TESOL. And this translanguaging lens is, first of all, a descriptive one of, you know, the practice of using language, a theoretical lens, and also a pedagogical lens. And that's kind of what we're interested in. How do I use translanguaging as a teacher to help my students learn in my own classroom? So again, different people in applied linguistics who have been, um, who have been looking at um, you know, different aspects of translanguaging. Here's one framework by um, Mazik that talks about translanguaging as ideology, as theory, pedagogy, um, et cetera, right? Um, I would say that you know, translanguaging, we should think about translanguaging in terms of how does it address these practical problems for us as teachers, right? And these are two questions that I wanna think about here. What types of multilingual practices support language learning? You know, is it okay to break that 90% rule? How should the use of languages be organized in language classrooms? If I need to try, if I'm trying to achieve what Garcia says as a, as a um, productive or healthy um, interrelationship of, amongst the languages, then, then how do I do that? Right? And so Garcia and other colleagues um, here in the United States, particularly in, um, in New York, um, have worked on this, uh, worked on these pedagogical materials here and are looking at different ways of implementing translanguaging pedagogy, right? Again, some of these are within um, bilingual classrooms, but also some of them are within TESOL or what are called ESL classrooms here in um, the United States. And so what they've developed then is, in thinking about this relationship and thinking about this model, um, they've developed the translanguaging pedagogy in terms of three things. 
the ideology or what they call the stance, your lesson planning or what they call the design, and then your moment to moment decision making as a teacher in the classroom or what they call shifts, right? And so you can see it's kind of from the big level of ideology stance to the intermediate level of planning and, and designing your lessons and uh, according to the curriculum, the design, and then according to the way that you implement that as a teacher, according to all those moment to moment decisions that you make <coughs> as a teacher that leads to the interaction within the classroom. And together, this creates what Li Wei, who's another um, big uh, scholar in the area of translanguaging, creates what he calls translanguaging spaces. This is a little dense here, but I want to give you the sense of how he writes about this idea of translanguaging spaces. He says it's a space that's created by and for translanguaging practices, and a space where language users break down the ideologically laden dichotomies between the micro, the macro and the micro, the societal and the individual and the social and the psychological through interaction. <clears throat> so interaction between the teacher and the students is very, very important, right? For creating translanguaging spaces. He says a translanguaging space allows language users to integrate social spaces that have been formally separated through different practices in different places. Translanguaging is not simply going between different linguistic structures, cognitive and semiotic systems and modalities, but going beyond them. The act of translanguaging creates a social space for the language user by bringing together different dimensions of their personal history, experience, and environment, their attitude, belief, and ideology, their cognitive and physical capacity into one coordinated and meaningful performance. You can see he's thinking very big and very sort of ambitiously here, right? This is why I think, again, a lot of people were very excited by this idea of translanguaging, right? Because in terms of um, kind of how it how it gets us to think very differently about languages and about our job as language teachers. I think that's that's very exciting. Right? But again, the rub is in, or the, the the important thing is in. Like, well, what? How do we how do we implement this as teachers, right? And so, let's say there's a a, a few different um, things that translanguaging is not, right? One, like translanguaging is not separating languages, especially in bilingual programs here in the United States. Sometimes they say, well, Monday is for English and Tuesday is for Spanish, right? And that's, we're doing both languages. But again, you're doing both languages like separately, right? Translanguaging is not echo translation. Sometimes I hear the teacher say something in English and then they repeat it, the, giving the translation in the home language. That's what I call echo translation. Echo because, again, you, 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 you repeat the same thing in the other language. That's not translation. Translanguaging is also not what is often known as the grammar translation method, right? Where again, you're focusing on how do we correctly translate sentences. There may be some elements of translation to translanguaging, but it's not grammar translation method, right? So again, we should be clear about what translanguaging um, isn't. Let's look at some examples of what is translanguaging then, or what could translanguaging pedagogy look like? And again, this is where um, researchers now in applied linguistics are starting to explore different ways that teachers are successfully implementing effective translanguaging pedagogy. So this is an example from Velasco and Garcia. They looked at how students writing drafts in their home language supported the development of academic writing in English, right? And so again, using in this case, using Spanish as a scaffold to produce um, the uh, academic writing in English. So again, there's, there's, uh, if you're looking at uh, L2 writing as a process, there's a role there for the L1 in helping to scaffold their thinking and organizing their, their ideas. Here's another example. This is um, a transcript from a classroom here. Um, uh, it's a, uh, a science lesson or what's sometimes called the CLIL approach. Maybe you've heard of CLIL as content language integrated learning. And so in this case, the, um, the researcher POSA is looking at these interactional data to see how translanguaging co-constructs understanding of scientific concepts while the students are working collaboratively in small groups to produce a science report, right? And so again, he sees that within those discussions, even though they have to produce the science report in standard English, the discussion around that is in their home language, right? And so again, the, the, the discussion, or not even just in their home language, but in kind of um, in, in both languages, right? Or what we sometimes call here Spanglish, right? The combination of English and Spanish. And so again, he says that use of Spanglish within the, the student's discussion 
is a very productive scaffold for helping them produce the report in English. Right? And then others have looked at sort of how, um, how translanguaging can even be built into tasks or activities. This is an example from a, um, a, 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 an ESL classroom where the student's first language is, is Chinese and how um, selective use of translations can uh, be helpful as well. So again, various um, examples of what these strategies will show. Um, here's another example in a uh, elementary grade classroom. I think this is from maybe second or third grade. And here the teachers are using different um, strategies to show, um, uh, use uh, translanguaging in terms of cognates and in terms of uh, what we would call um, graphic organizers here to help students uh, scaffold their knowledge. I've been working with a, a group of teachers at a local school here in uh, Ohio in the United States to, um, to, again, to think about how teachers, even teachers who have many years of experience in the classroom, can use translanguaging um, in their classrooms through a peer coaching project um, using videos to demonstrate um, translanguaging through something called the GLAD method, right, which is a type of shelter construction. So again, what we can see here is that all of these examples here of um, using translanguaging pedagogy, of creating, again, what Li Wei calls these translanguaging spaces um, based on an ideology of flexible multilingualism. How, again, this is kind of exciting for um, the, the possibilities that we have, right? But again, we should be realistic about it because we know that, again, in the curriculum through sort of traditional teaching methods, which are very, very strongly ingrained, I myself was trained in, in many of those methods um, uh, back in the day, um, that it kind of frames our thinking in terms of how our TESOL classrooms really should be monolingual spaces, right? Um, and framed through what we would call normative ideologies of language purism, of standard language through monolingualism, right? And so, again, as I said, at a, at a sort of an ideological level or what we call the level of, of a translanguaging stance, we have to be um, aware and very thoughtful about how we try to change that paradigm, right? Because again, you can see that translanguaging really is a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift, not just from multi monolingualism to dynamic bilingualism, but it's a way that it's a difference from thinking of language as a linguistic object. Language is a set of grammar rules um, to thinking of language as a social practice or what we nowadays call languaging as a semiotic practice, right? Um, instead of just thinking of it as terms of input and output, which again, for a lot of us who are trained in, in um, approaches in second language acquisition, that's kind of how we thought about it to uh, what um, translanguaging folks would call the multilingual participation and engagement. And getting back to that question of, you know, the role of the L1, it's a move from thinking of L1 as a source of interference or sort of L1 as a problem to thinking of the L1 as a resource. L1 is part of, again, the student's linguistic repertoire. So again, that's a, a kind of a big shift in the way that we have to, to think about this. And so what um, my colleagues, uh, Jean Pen Tian and, and others, um, we recently uh, co-edited this book called Envisioning TESOL Through a Translanguaging Lens. And what we were trying to do there was take a collection of different projects that teachers and researchers have done in many different countries here. You can see this includes um, ESL and EFL context and lots of different um, settings, including um, elementary and, and secondary, including um, uh, in different as aspects and uh, a assessment and task-based learning to show all the different ways that translanguaging can be used uh, nowadays. And as well, for, for me, myself, and I know some of you that work in higher education, you're also thinking of this in terms of teacher education, right? And that one of the central goals of language teacher education should be to counteract monolingual ideologies of TESOL and also to frame language education as social justice work, right? And that probably means something very different in Indonesia than it does here in the United States. Um, but again, that's something that, that I think was very important to this, um, this idea of um, a translanguaging framework. And as well, to connect, um, to connect our pedagogies to multilingual students' identity. So we have notions here in the United States, for example, of um, trying to use something called funds of knowledge or other approaches then, again, that build on 
um, the, the students' home languages and home cultures. And I want to give you one example here that um, one of my uh, one of our uh, doctoral students here at the Ohio State University, this is Yuseva Iswandari, um, she was working with a teacher in uh, Jogjakarta, uh, oops, sorry, Jogjakarta, that should be, in a BA TEFL program at a private university. And um, here the teacher was, um, was uh, completing a micro-teaching course. And there was a lot of different languages in the classroom. The teacher's languages were Javanese, Indonesian, and English. But you see here the students came from, from many different um, areas. And so although most of the students spoke Javanese as their home language, there were at least five other languages represented um, in the classroom, which of course isn't, isn't that common in Indonesia, right? And so here's an example from um, the data that, uh, that uh, Yuseva collected. Um, and here you see she's using something called discourse analysis to analyze her data here. But what I want you to, to, to notice is, and she's tried to sort of color code um, these here to show that how the teacher is using English, Indonesian, and Javanese together. And she interviewed the teacher about this and she asked him, you know, so what is your, what is your approach? The teacher didn't really know the term translanguaging, but he did kind of have an idea of translanguaging pedagogy because he described his approach as what he calls flexible. I always try to use English as often as possible, he said, but I'm also very flexible. I'm aware that both my students and I cannot use the English 100% because there are words and expressions that cannot be translated into English. Besides, in my opinion, the use of language is actually flexible. When my students go to schools for teaching practice next semester, I'm sure that they won't use English all the time. And this is based on what I observed as the school's teaching practice coordinator. And so he recognized that, that, that because his, his, um, his novice teachers then were going to be working with students often at a, at a very beginner level, well, of course, they're going to rely on the L1, right? And so instead of trying to insist on 100% or even 90%, what he says is, well, let's take a flexible approach, right? And again, I think this is a very nice example of um, translanguage and pedagogy. Um, notice this. Here's another example that I found really, really interesting um, that Yuseva was analyzing. I'll give you just a moment to read the transcript, and then I'll point out some things that I think are really interesting. So again, this is a micro teaching class with English teachers. And the expectation is that the class, both the instructor and the, the students are going to be using English. But again, that wasn't a strict rule. And you can see again, how the teacher had created, again, what they would call translanguaging spaces, translanguaging spaces that allowed them to use Indonesian and Javanese, but not just the Indonesian Javanese language, but notice that he's referring again to prominent educational figures from Indonesia, and also um, proverbs um, and sayings in Javanese, right? And so what's interesting here is that by kind of combining the different languages and encouraging the students to do the same thing, he's, he's um, doing a couple different things here, right? At least two different things, I would say. The first thing I would say that he's doing is using translanguaging to connect to the students' Indonesian and Javanese identity. Right. And so again, even though this is in English, um, he's opening up those spaces, which I think is really important because we talked about TESOL and particularly the communicative language teaching approach as something that's being uh, exported from the West, and mostly in um, North America and European contexts to other EFL contexts. Right. And so what Suresh Kanagaraja and Adrian Holiday and others have argued is what we really need to do is, is be able to appropriate those, those pedagogies or those methods in a way that is uh, appropriate based on local knowledge and local ways of doing things. And I think that's what the, the teacher is doing here, right? He may be training the, his, his students to use communicative language teaching methods, but he's doing it in a way through translanguaging that makes it um, very uh, appropriate and connected to the local context where his students are going to be working. Right? So those are a couple of examples then of how 
um, translanguaging can open up different possibilities here. And so what I would say in conclusion then is that a translanguaging stance challenges outdated notions of language separation and hierarchies. Okay? That the research um, more and more suggests that translanguaging pedagogy supports student learning in at least three different ways, right? It, it, it uh, improves their language proficiency, uh, their acquisition of the target language, by, uh, by uh, be, uh, serving as a cognitive scaffold, and also the content knowledge, as well as students' multilingual identity, and the exa as an example we just saw. Finally, I think we should recognize, though, that, um, again, in spite of the, the, the excitement and the, the, the potential that translanguaging has, again, this is a, still a very new idea, and we're still trying to figure out, you know, what is the most effective way to use it? And I think there are some very important questions that we need to think about if we're trying to use a translanguaging pedagogy together with communicative language teaching in EFL contexts in Indonesia. So I think the first question is, will students in EFL contexts get enough exposure to English? So, you know, especially if students, I don't know, if they're seventh grade students who only get maybe 90 minutes of English instruction per week. 90 minutes is not a lot, right? And so again, if I'm, if I'm allowing for translanguaging and I only have 90 minutes, is that gonna open the door for teachers and students to use too much L1? And also for teachers maybe who kind of have an idea of translanguaging, but again, maybe they're not trained with it or maybe they don't understand it as well. And I say, well, no, it's fine to use the L1. Well, is that really gonna open the door and justify using kind of outdated um, teaching methods like grammar translation? I, I insisted that translanguaging is not grammar translation, but when I talk to people, they're like, well, oh, so you're saying that it's good to get students to translate. It's like, well, <laughs> it's a little different, right? And that's where, again, it's sometimes difficult to, um, to understand how is translanguaging represent a very different approach than a traditional grammar translation method. And since translanguaging is not really a teaching method per se, again, I said that there's this framework, it's stance, design, and shift, right? But again, that framework is really, a, it's a framework. It's not really a method not a series of prescriptive steps for teachers to follow, right? And so if that's the case, if it's not really a, a very concrete method, then how can I train new TESOL teachers to use it effectively, right? So again, I think those are some um, questions that are you know, still difficult questions, still questions maybe that we haven't entirely um, been able to answer yet, but I think it's worth discussing as we explore um, ways to try to implement effective translanguaging pedagogy in EFL context. So thank you for your time and attention. And um, I don't know, Dr. Sapriani, if we have some time now for the q and I'd be happy to, uh, to open this up for uh, a discussion. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sayer, for a uh, very insightful knowledge. Um, we learned a lot about what is translanguaging and what is not translanguaging. And before speaking of uh, what is translanguaging and what is not translanguaging, I think Dr. Sayer show us a very good metaphor of bilingualism. Uh, that bilingualism is not a bicycle, meaning that uh, when we are bilingual, we don't see two languages as a two separate languages or two separate monolingual. But then we see bilingual as a dynamic and we draw on our linguistic repertoire um, fluently. Yeah? So I think what is very important to note here, or something that I note from your presentation, Dr. Sayer, is translanguaging is not language separation. Tra translanguaging is not echo translation, because that's probably something that we have been confused so far. And translanguaging is not grammar translation method. And of course, there are so many uh, interesting uh, content that Dr. Sayer has shared with us. And before we continue with the question and answer session, please allow me to apologize again for the technical issue that happened before the plenary session started this morning. And we would like to have probably three questions for the first term, because we're going to have 30 minutes for the question and answer session. So I'd like to open the first term for three questions. Is that okay, Dr. Sayer? We have three questions probably from the audience here and the at the MP theater and 
also probably some questions also from the uh, participants in the Zoom link, okay? So is there any questions from the audience here? Yes, Ibu Asmi. Okay, Ibu Asmi first. Thank you very much, Ibu Afika. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sayer, for the very rich and insightful presentation on translanguaging. I have a lot uh, in my mind actually to ask, but <laughs> I will pick some uh, that uh, I think uh, is important. Uh, the last slides that you have presented is really interesting on uh, those four questions, will students uh, in EFL context uh, get even enough exposure to English? Because that is also one thing that we need to consider here in Indonesia, in which students probably only have the exposure to English in the classroom. And then uh, the second question is also pretty interesting, in which does translanguaging open the door for teachers to get to, to have an excuse uh, of using uh, that echo uh, translating, yeah, echo translation or grammar translation method. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in that examples of uh, having uh, the, the Spanish or French uh, that you uh, presented in your previous slide, in which students first write in uh, their first language and then uh, use that as a resource for their writing in English. Uh, was it a type of uh, grammar translation or what in that in that context? And then uh, the second one, uh, considering the limited exposure of students to English outside the classroom, uh, the use of translanguaging in our context. Do you think it's more appropriate when uh, we use it in the EMI context or? Uh, can we also use it, uh, because I'm thinking that when our students here at university in the first and uh, second semester, they are in the process of developing and uh, making their English skills better, so we need to have that lots of uh, inputs and they need to get lots of exposure to English. So my personal consideration is that if we uh, do not use uh, mostly or uh, English all the time, I probably will be in that uh, position of uh, language can be a problem. I mean, uh, in quotation, their first language. Uh, but in a way, as an Indonesian and as a, a person who speak uh, three languages, I'm also that uh, into the opinion of Janakaraja in Halliday and Kachuru in which there are identities uh, negotiation within me uh, between using the language, uh, uh, the English as my foreign language and between building my identity, Indonesian and Javanese identity while I'm using English. Yeah, sorry if it's uh, too much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Sayer. Uh, thank you. Bless thank me. you so much. Yeah, that's um, a great question. Or yeah. other questions. Um, so let, let me try to address, I think there's kind of two main parts to the right, question right, there. Yeah. So let me address the first one just sure, to explain. Sure. Um, in the example, we saw where the students were writing. Um, it was not grammar translation. They were not sort of drafting their, their writing first in their home language and then translating that into English. That wasn't really the, 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 the main point. What the teacher was using was something called a writing workshop approach or what's sometimes called a, a process writing approach. Again, where you ask the students to, uh, to uh, brainstorm, to, uh, create, you know, to create mind maps, to do different things to sort of generate their ideas. They talk to their peers and they get feedback on that. And so it's, it's, a process, it's an approach to um, teaching second language writing where there's a lot of um, interaction and feedback and the, and the things go through multiple drafts, right? And so that's the idea sort of as, um, as, a, uh, as a scaffold then, as a way of helping the students to generate and organize their ideas that they need in order to um, help their writing be more uh, uh, 
coherent and better organized, right? And so it was really, that's the role of the L1 in that case as a, as a scaffold, both written scaffold, but also as they're doing um, the, the peer interactions there to talk about their writing. Um, and so to just to clarify again, that was I not see. an example I of see. grammar yeah, translation. Um, although again, as I said, there may have been some translating there. There may have been an earlier draft um, that, that was in their, their um, language, uh, in their home language or often teachers. When they're asking the students to do a free write and write as much as you can in English, but if you can't think of the word right away, just write it in your own language and keep going, right? And so again, some of those approaches to, um, to writing um, that are more process uh, oriented approaches, again, they, they, they may use some translation there, but again, it's, it's, it's as, a, as, a, um, as a, a scaffold. Um, the second part of your question was, well, what is more, the more appropriate way um, for using uh, for, for using translanguaging in different contexts, uh, including EMI. Um, and again, I'm not as, you know, I, I'm not as familiar with the Indonesian context, so I can't really answer that definitively, but I would say in, um, in many contexts where they have um, EMI, particularly in higher education, um, translanguaging happens naturally anyway. I was working with a colleague from Cambodia, and he was looking at how EMI classrooms in higher education in Cambodia particularly when the materials were in English, but the students didn't have a high enough proficiency in, um, in English, at least in spoken English, to be able to have deep, meaningful, critical conversations around the material. So even though they could read the material, um, when they were trying to kind of um, help understand it and discuss it and extend their own ideas there and use critical thinking, Again, the, um, the use of Khmer in this case, it was in Cambodia, the use of Khmer or Cambodian was um, a very important, uh, again, a very important scaffold and a very important way that the instructor allowed the students to engage with the material in English, even though it was an EMI classroom. But he pointed out that the instructor was able to do that because there wasn't a very explicit language policy. Even though they said, we're supposed to use EMI, he's like, well, what does that mean exactly? There's no specific language policy beyond just use EMI. And so that's again where I think if you're an instructor who's working at an institution where it's supposed to be English medium of instruction, you need to decide amongst yourselves, well, what does that really mean? Is there, again, is within our definition of EMI, are there ways that we can use translanguaging? And again, what for us, what are the effective translanguaging strategies, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where I'm saying that even though translanguaging isn't a method, I do think we can we can identify specific ways that translanguaging can be effective. And I think again, use like with our project here where we're using video and then we're identifying those effective um, practices and then using the video to share those practices with our colleagues to say, oh yeah, I see that teacher's using them that way. That's really, really interesting. Kind of similar to what Yuseva was doing with the teacher in Indonesia, where she was saying, notice how the teacher here is using Javanese and uh, Indonesian together with English and sort of see how he's doing that, that to me seems like a very good strategy, right? Again, even though it's an EMI context. So that's what I would say is that, you know, that, that takes some very thoughtful discussions, some professional development work amongst colleagues there to first of all, define what is exactly your, your language policy um, and your pedagogical model that you want. And within that, then what are the effective ways to use translanguaging? And again, help to, you know, use peer coaching and use peer training and use, you know, the power of video um, to document those practices and share them so that we can train each other. So thank you for the question. Thank you for the insight, uh, Dr. Saya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can we have the second questions from the audience here or the audience at the Zoom? Yeah, uh, the IT staff, can you please help us to show the Zoom on the screen? Is there any questions from the audience? Oh, ini Ibu Irma. Ibu Irma Rahayu. Hello, Ibu Irma. Okay. Can you hear us? Right, can I? Ah, Ibu Irma, yeah. Can you please can introduce? Can I address my question? Sure, sure. Yes, can please. you hear us, Ibu Irma? Uh -huh. Uh, okay, over here. Good morning, Professor Sayer. Maybe it's, uh, it's night over there. 
And yes, thank you very, very much. very late here in, in Ohio. It's uh, after 10 o'clock at night. But, yeah. All right. I hope that everything is going well over there because uh, uh, it yes, seems right. that um, right now there are, uh, there's a hot, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a hot atmosphere. It's uh, attacking right. some of the north area. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the explanation. And Translanguaging over here is uh, kind of a very new for me, and uh, I would like to to give a very technical question. Actually, um, sure. here um, most of the teachers in Indonesia here uh, they are actually has already applied this uh, translanguaging for so many years. Uh, start from the start from the we are teaching start from we were teaching uh, English uh, to the students so. Uh, most of the teachers, um, what is it, a uh, kind of uh, using or inserting our local language in whenever we are teaching English. And we usually trap using our language or uh, yeah, using more of our langu language than using the tar target language. So that's, uh, that's a kind of a very hard whenever we are posing uh, uh, ourselves uh, what is it uh, to to adjust when we use the when we use English and then when we have to switch to uh, uh, when when we use our local language and then when we use to switch to English. So uh, can you give us the uh, suggestions when is actually we need to uh, to switch uh, or is there any any certain condition that uh, which is, which is the condition that we need to strengthen the English and can very loose using English. And then my second question, I'm very sorry, uh, I, I need to, to ask this too. So um, is there any other condition that, uh, what I mean is that the dealing with the student's level or student age uh, when we start or when this translanguaging is really effective to use. All right, that's all, Professor Sayer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irma. Those are great questions. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I don't want to kind of just generalize um, too much. I think to answer your second question first, I think we see lots of examples. I mentioned examples from elementary grades um, and particularly here in the U.S. context from elementary grades that even in first grade or second grade. But we also see many examples just like I was talking about with EMI context and higher education. So I don't think it depends so much on the age because we see that there's you know a, a wide range of different um, contexts where people have looked at trans languages. I also don't think it depends necessarily on the proficiency level. So for example, as I said, we, we looked at um, some uh, uh, contexts where students are very, very beginner levels. And so of course, they can't produce a lot of spoken English yet. They need to rely on their first language. But also, I'm sorry, Dr. Sayer, I think the- Oops, sorry, okay. I think I accidentally got muted. As I was saying here, then even, even in uh, relatively higher proficiency levels like EMI context, again, there may be certain way, um, things that translanguaging is useful and effective for. So again, I would say it doesn't necessarily depend on age or proficiency level. Although again, the purposes and the strategies you're gonna use, obviously they need to be age appropriate and they need to be proficiency level appropriate. But again, translanguaging in that sense can be used um, in, 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 in any age or any proficiency level. But to your second question of like, how exactly do you do it, right? Now, again, that's that's to me the billion dollar question, right? It's like, like when do I exactly do I use it? And so again, if I go back to, I showed you that framework, it's stance, design and shift. And again, the stance is sort of like my disposition, like what that teacher said, I think what you said too is exactly right because you said that, well, I think our teachers have been doing this for a long time, right? Now we have the term, we call it translanguaging, like it's something so new. But in fact, our teachers have been already doing this 
for a long time, even though that teacher, he didn't call it translanguaging, he called it, oh, I'm being flexible, I'm being very flexible, right? But so they already had the idea as, you know, as a good teacher, as an experienced teacher, we already have the idea that it's good to sort of connect to the students, it's good to bring in the students' own culture, bring in the students' own identity, right? Now we have a term for that, let's call it translanguaging. But in fact, we sort of know as teachers with experience that that's something that's good to do anyway, that's effective teaching practice, right? But now since we have the term translanguaging, we can be much more intentional about it. We can be much more strategic about how we're gonna apply that. So that's at the level of stance, but the strategy, the, 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 the particular techniques that we're gonna use, that's at the level of design and shift. I think the difference again is if I'm designing something and I'm doing it very intentional, like before the lesson, right? Like I gave the example of the writing teacher. The writing teacher, she knew exactly when she was gonna get the students to brainstorm and to work together and to use their first language in this way. And she actually gave them instructions. Now talk together, use whatever language you want and discuss the, the, your ideas about the writing. So again, that was designed because it was very intentional. She had that in her lesson plan beforehand. But there's also this idea of shift. And the shift, as I said, that's like the moment to moment um, decisions that the teacher makes, the things that you can't anticipate like what we sometimes call teachable moments, right? A teachable moment is like, oh, there's an opportunity here. I can do this as a teacher because again, especially when you have more experience as a teacher, you don't need to sort of follow your lesson plan perfectly, you know, like so rigidly. Now you have a little bit more freedom and creativity there. Like the example that we saw from Yuseba's study there where she saw that the teacher probably, he didn't have that idea to use to introduce that proverb in Japanese. I'm sure that he didn't. It was just that that came up and like, oh, here's an opportunity. So let's connect that, right? And so again, that was a technique that you can't exactly plan for that. But again, if you have that sort of open, flexible sort of approach to it, then you're able to take advantage of those opportunities and use those sorts of strategies in ways that I think are very, very effective, even if they're not sort of exactly part of your, your plan, right? But again, I think beyond that, I think it really, really depends on, again, what kind of classroom and we mentioned the age and the proficiency level. So I think again, translanguaging, effective translanguaging strategies will look a lot different in a classroom where you're trying to um, develop the student L2 writing versus a CLIL classroom versus an EMI classroom. So again, I don't know, that's why I can't sort of generalize too much. Um, but as Lee Wei was saying, a lot of it has to do with those interactions. A lot of it, and that's why you see, as I mentioned, you saw those transcripts and a lot of the research they're using um, the, the transcripts from the classroom interaction, because that's what they're saying. That's where a lot of the, the translanguaging spaces are happening, right? And so again, as a teacher thinking about, well, I know that I wanna introduce different routines. Good morning, class, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Well, no, that needs to be in English, right? Because I want to, I want to, um, to, to introduce my, my students to those routines, to those common things that they would say in English. Um, I definitely want to have all of that in English, but again, maybe when we're discussing a topic or when the students are giving their opinions, or again, when these, um, when these uh, opportunities arise to discuss things that are relevant to the, to the students' culture and identities, that's maybe where I'm going to um, allow, be more flexible about the approach, right? And so, again, that's what I would say is if you're, you're, you're thinking about kind of how can I be um, intentional about that um, uh, use of translanguaging strategy. Thank you for the question, that was a really good question. Thank you, Professor Sayers. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sayer, and also thank you, Ibu Elma. We only have 10 minutes left, so why don't we have uh, one more question, but very short. Okay, um, yeah, the audience on the very back. I'm sorry, Dr. Sayer, that the, you know, the camera cannot really move around, so, but there are so many people here in the audience. All right. All right, thank you for the great presentation, Professor. So um, I have a question. Um, I'm still confused uh, in relation to translanguaging. So uh, because uh, what is the difference between translanguaging and code switching? Because both of them are using more than one language in our uh, teaching and learning process. So that's my question, thank you. 
I Thank don't know you. if that's a very short, short question. That's a very complicated question, question too, to I'll, clarify I'll, um, what is the I'll difference between translating and code yeah. switching. And in fact, that's usually the starting point, right? The starting point of trying to think about translanguaging is code switching. Because especially if you've studied linguistics and sociolinguistics, you know that people have been studying and talking about code switching for, for many, many years, right? And, and initially, that was my reaction, to be honest to you. When, when I read Ophelia Garcia's work, and I'm like, why does she say translanguaging? We already have a perfectly good term called code switching. Why does she need to introduce a new term that just seems like kind of confusing, right? But I think that the answer there is, again, as I said, there's a theoretical foundation of translanguaging, which is actually very, very different than code switching. Again, code switching assumes that there are two different linguistic systems, and they're going to interact with each other. Right? And so in this case, I did some of my early research on Spanish and English and looking at how when, when Spanish English bilinguals, when they code switch, how do the different syntactic systems, right? The syntax of English and the syntax of Spanish are very different. How do, how do, um, how do bilinguals then who are code switching, how do they form um, grammatically uh, correct sentences in uh, well code switching, right? So those are the sort or again, other questions like what is the social motivation for code switching? Those are the sorts of questions maybe that um, that linguists and uh, were asking around code switching. But what Ophelia Garcia, I think, was doing was saying, well, what we're really interested in is as how people use languages as a social practice in classrooms. And what, why do I care about that as a teacher, right? And so I think that she brought that not so much as like a linguistic question, Maybe for linguists, it's good to you know study code switching and, and call it code switching. But again, for for her as an educational um, researcher, again, who has a background in linguistics, but she doesn't do linguistics. She does um, you know questions around um, uh, language and education, right? She's more of an educational linguist, if you want to call it that. Again, her concern is um, how does this help teachers and students learn language and content in the classroom. Right, and so that's where she said, "Well, the code switching framework, it does, it's not, it, it's not powerful enough, or at least it doesn't ask the right kind of questions that I'm interested in. If you're interested in syntax, and if you're interested in analyzing intrasentential and intersentential code switching, and all those kinds of questions, the grammatical constraints on, you know, intrasentential intra code switching, then she says, fine, call it code switching, and you can go and study that. But again, if you're interested in how." teachers and students can, um, can uh, use the language in the classroom and interaction to learn and teach stuff, then she says translanguaging is much, much more powerful, right? Because again, the, the presumption isn't that there's code A and code B and you're gonna switch them. The starting point is students have, again, a full linguistic repertoire and they use that to make sense of things, um, problems that they encounter in the classroom. And that's what, um, what uh, translanguaging allows us to do, right, is to look at sort of how, um, again, their, their multiple language practices, their flexible language practices can serve as a cognitive scaffold, as things that connect to their multilingual identity, and again, as a pedagogical practice, right? And again, none of that was in the code switching framework. Again, code switching didn't ask those sorts of questions, which again is why, why we would argue that, you know, translanguaging is, at least for us as, as teachers and applied linguists, much, much more powerful um, framework and again much more powerful in terms of, of thinking about the pedagogical possibilities for translation. So again, thank you. That was a re really good. All of those questions were, were fantastic questions. So thank you everyone so much for your uh, for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sayer, and thank you so much for the questions. Um, I think I believe there are so many questions from other participants, but then unfortunately the time doesn't permit for us to have a further discussion with Dr. Sayer and also because I think in the Columbus time it's already very late, so we are very fortunate that Dr. Sayer with his generosity to share his insightful knowledge and also very inspiring uh, theory on translanguaging. Um, I think uh, there are so many things that we learned from this morning session and also Dr. Sayer really teach us to see um, the languages that we speak as our linguistic repertoire. We can draw off them, we can draw on them when we teach um, a new language to our students. Um, since all of us, as you may know, Dr. Sayer, 
that everybody in Indonesia was born bilingual. So if we start teaching a new language to our students, then we probably teach them to become an emergent multilingual, yeah? yeah, either English or Arabic. Okay, so please give applause uh, to our presenter today. Thank you, thank you. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Sayer, and we really apologize for some technical issue this morning and also for some confusion related to the uh, different time zone this morning. But again, that we really appreciate for the insightful knowledge and also for the time and for the opportunity for everybody here to have some discussion with you. So um, before we continue to the next uh, plenary speaker, I think we're going to have some uh, very good news from our English language program that we are going to launch a service learning center. So Dr. Sayer, if you still have some uh, minutes with us, so starting from 9.30, we are going to launch a service learning center. So as you also address uh, the issue of social justice, this is part of our effort to address social justice in language education. So um, we will have our vice dean one uh, to join with us for the, the launching of this service learning center. And then the name of service learning for the service learning center itself is foreign language service learning center, even though it is under the uh, program of English language education. Uh, but again, Dr. Sayer, if you have uh, to leave, please feel free to do so. But if you'd like to join us to see the launch, uh, the launching of Service Learning Center, uh, you are more than welcome to do that. I'd like to give this opportunity back to the uh, MC. Oh my God. That was my phone. All right, thank you for the rich and interesting in, in explanation from Peter Sayer from Ohio University and Mim Avida. The next agenda, we would like to participate in inauguration process of the Foreign Language Service Learning Center of UIN Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. So we will watch a video about the service learning.
So I want to give you short explanations about the surface learning. So surface learning is an educational approach, whereas uh, students learn theories in the classroom. And at the same time, volunteers with the FNC are usually a nonprofit or social service group and engage in reflections activities to deepen uh, their understanding of what is being thought. English language education departments, UINSA has applied this service learning into the teaching learning process. And today, in this session, we will officially launch Foreign Language Service Center. So, we would like to invite the Professor Dr. Haji Husniyatu Salama Zainiati, MAG, as the Vice Dean of the Academic Affairs at Faculty of Education and Teachers Training and all the lecturers of English Language Education Departments to come to the stage. So in the screen will be a virtual push button, virtual button. So Professor Titi can push the button, virtual button. Please so kindly, please kindly Professor push the virtual button. One, two. Okay, all of the all of the lectures, please. <laughs> Okay, we can count down, everyone. Tiga, dua, satu. All right, thank you very much. So with how good this inauguration. On behalf of the Faculty of Education and Teacher Training, we officially launch Foreign Language Service Learning Center of Win Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So with how good this inauguration is, hopefully we can all become professional future teachers and keep up with advanced technology in order to advance education in Indonesia. Now we invite uh, for the photo session, please uh, our representative of the lecture, we can make photo session. <laughs>
So surface learning is an educational approach where a student learns theory in the classroom and in the same time the volunteers with the agency and engage in reflections activities to deepen their understanding of what being told. <laughs> English Language Education Department, UINSA, has applied the service learning. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for Professor Peter Sayer for attend this inauguration process of Foreign Language Service Learning Center. Okay everyone, for the next agenda, Dr. Aguma Wangjati from Institute Technology Bandung with the theme, The Role of Digital Artificial Intelligence for Education, Prediction and Practical Ideas. And then I will invite our gorgeous moderator, Muhammad Shaifuddin, MED, PhD. Without any further ado, please welcome Bapak Gumawang and Bapak Shaifuddin. This is the hot seat, ya. Yeah. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah, walhamdulillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli Sayyidina Muhammad. Rabbi surahli sadri wa yafirli amri. Wa khlul uqdatan min lisani ya fau qawli amin. <coughs> Yang saya hormati, uh, <coughs> the head of the department, Kiai Faizin, uh, the head of the English education uh, program, Ibu Rahmawati, and all the participants and the committees, and Wabil Khusus, our uh, speaker, keynote speaker, Ibu Dr. Ramiza Darmi, welcome to our campus, and also her husband, my colleague, my friend, when I was in Toowoomba, Baba Shafain, <coughs> welcome to our campus, welcome to Surabaya, and welcome to Indonesia. <coughs> Bapak, Ibu sekalian yang saya hormati, today, this morning, we will have a session with Prof. Uh, A. Gumawang Jati. That will be the first question that I will ask Pak Jati later. What does A stand for? Because I have known Pak Jati for quite some times, but I still do not know what does A stand for, Pak. <coughs> uh, so, this session we will have Pak Jati, uh, who are an ex, who is an expert in ICT in education, especially ICT. Uh, use in 
ILT. Pak Jati has been working in this area for many years. He has published many articles on ICT and language teaching. If you visit his Google Scholar pages, you will find that there are uh, many, many articles on ICT in education and ICT in English language teaching. Pak Jati itself now, Pak Jati himself now is the president of ITEL, Indonesia Technology Enhanced Language Learning. <coughs> so you may want to know more about ITEL later by Googling. <coughs> uh, Today, he will be uh, talking about artificial intelligence in education. Yeah, artificial intelligence in education. Just to make sure that we will depart from the same ground. Do you familiar with this term, right? AI, artificial intelligence? Okay, good. Uh, what AI product that are familiar to you that you have been using in our daily life? Can you mention one, two? Yes, uh, turn it in, good. Siri. What else? Siri. Google Assistant, yeah, that's good, yeah. What else? Yeah, the Grammarly, yeah, and still many others. Technologies that uses artificial intelligence. Actually, there are a lot of potentials that we can make use of when we are dealing with artificial intelligence. Today, Pak Jati will be exploring why and how we can use AI for education and for language teaching. So without further ado, me as moderator, my name is Shaifuddin, uh, will invite Pak Jati to speak for about 30 minutes, 50 minutes, for 50 minutes. And after Pak Jati do his presentation, you may, we may have the Q&A sessions. Okay, Pak Jati, silahkan. Waktu 50 menit. Oke, okay. uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, uh, selamat pagi. Answering Pak Saifuddin questions. Thank you very much, Pak, uh, for being a moderator. Um, A stand for Anuncius, so that's uh, my Christian name. Oh, thank you. Uh, I never use it, rarely use it, actually. That's why I, I'm glad to be called Jati, that's enough. Um, let's answer your question, Pak Saifuddin. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let me start my session with sharing my screen. And I want to interact with you later on um, during my talk. Yeah. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now, if you want to interact with me, take your mobile phone out from your pocket and go to your browser. Go to canva.live. So go to canva.live. Then you have to enter the code. The code is 608349. It's always there. Then uh, write your name. 
and then um, you can say hi to me you can say hi to participants uh, to interact with me during uh, the talk so you can ask questions in the middle of my talk will be no problem no worries rather than wait later kalau menunggu di belakang biasanya lupa yeah okay thank you very much so i'm going to look at the role of ai uh, in education First, uh, i'm teaching english so i'm going to use a lot of example uh, in english and some prediction and maybe some ideas yeah okay thank you Pak Ilham. good morning uh, now um, this is the prediction not my prediction but the prediction from unesco yeah education will transformed by ai katanya you can believe or maybe believe with that maybe yes maybe no but that's okay teaching tools i'm going to show you some later ways of learning access to knowledge and also teacher training so if you have uh, fkip and uh, win uh, then you have to start thinking of uh, maybe modifying some of your uh, lesson and curriculum maybe and uh, syllabus and so on yeah so i'm going to give uh, some example here now in general ai in teaching and learning there are two one is uh, the teachers ai can be a tools so that the workload of the teachers uh, reduce the workload make us more focus on what we're going to teach and so on for students ai is a tools or software to learn but for university there are a lot of ai that you can use but i'm not going to talk it uh to talk about ai for university level and for the yayasan and uh for um wider scope i'm going to concentrate on teachers and students only yeah thank you okay now but say for in order already mentioned about google assistant google translate siri netflix spotify that's uh, ai that we use uh, everyday life no okay now using your mobile phone can you uh, type one word about this ai for your daily life can you type that in your mobile please what do you think of using uh, turn it in what do you think of using google translate say it in one word can you respond in uh, using your mobile or if you are in um, in the uh, you can also respond in the chat if you like okay helpful very good Bu Erma, thank you if you still anonymous you can type your your name if you want to be known if not yeah tidak apa -apa. simplicity easy okay thank you I don't respond internet yeah we we need connection for that yeah that's an example of uh, ai now my question is um about transport what is the biggest taxi company right now in indonesia can you type it in the chat box please efficient Thank you. That's uh, Nafila. You mentioned that in the chat box. Okay, good chat and grab. Thank you. Now, how many cars does that company have? Punya berapa mobil dia? Blue biru. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. None. Thank you. The biggest transport company in this country they don't have any cars taxi companies and they don't have any cars why because the way of thinking they use a lot of ai's yeah the use of ai's so that you can have a company taxi company without having taxi 
you can have a toko toko something big ya yeah? ya yeah? but you do not have any buildings you can have lapak but you don't have any building that's ai that's the uh, the challenge of the ai so out there ai has been used in business for so long and has been uh, put that in practice right now uh, in the language learning it's still quite new yeah <laughs> so uh, my questions what is the most time consuming consuming when preparing uh, to teach reading can you respond in the chat box or using your mobile so if you are teaching reading What's uh, the most uh, time-consuming when you do the preparation? Looking for suitable reading text. Thank you very much. Others? So you're looking for reading text. Yeah. So you're searching in the Google, you look for, for newspaper and so on. Ibu Erna, thank you. Preparing the readings and the questions. Identifying the reading, suitable reading text. The activity. Thank you. Okay. Do you think is there any AI that can help you? Adakah artificial intelligence yang bisa kita gunakan untuk membantu kita supaya kita waktu mengajar reading tidak terlalu time consuming? Anyone? Ada atau tidak ada? Itu aja dulu. You can respond in the chat, or you can use your mobile if you are in the auditorium. ITK, yes. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Kalau sudah tahu kira-kira apa? Ada, sir. Biasanya gunakan Google Docs. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm to do demonstration because that takes time later on, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Yeah? Lesson Writer, if you go to lessonwriter.com, that will help you preparing comprehension question, grammar focus, and vocabulary. So if you are using a text, then you're going to uh, make some questions, reading questions, comprehension. Tadi Ibu Erma kayaknya nulis preparing questions and grammar focus and vocabulary you can use lessonwriter.com it's free yeah you can log in have an account and follow the step yeah so you got the text harus punya teksnya dulu then you put the text there and you click 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 just follow the instruction at the end then you will have a lesson plan you will have uh, the handout for the student Yeah, a little bit note about this. This is not perfect, so you have to modify it. At least this will give you a draft for your lesson. Yeah, then you can modify that. Now, if you're teaching, uh, for example, in the uh, FIB, if you are teaching like. Uh, preparing a lesson or how to prepare a lesson, maybe you can ask your students to explore this and um, look for the weaknesses. What are the weaknesses of a lesson writer? Because this is a robot. Yeah. What human element can you put in that so that your lesson will be a lot better? Yeah. Jadi pesan saya, lesson writers jangan dipakai gitu aja. Should be a human touch, should be a teacher's touch that has many pedagogies that knows the students so you have to put in that but reduce your workload yeah because they will try the draft for you okay another one it's called uh, quillians how many of you familiar with quillians sudah kenal dengan quillians atau belum that's a question generator sudah atau belum just now not yet Okay, so if you're teaching reading or you're uh, 
a lecturer how to teach reading to your students. Maybe then you can introduce this AI to your students. It's called question generator. Later on, where you got my slide, I'm going to share it with you. Of course, then you can look at uh, the tutorial. I give you the tutorial uh, button there to explore. But I'm going to give you an example for this, so that uh, you got better idea how the AI work. So, questions generator. If you go to quillians.com, then of course you have to log in. Again, it's a, it's a freemium, meaning there are a lot of free things that you can do. If you want to do a pattern, then you have to pay. So, yeah, jadi pakai yang gratis-gratis boleh, pakai yang bayar juga boleh. My suggestion will be don't go to premium. Use the basic one is enough. So you click the title here, judulnya apa, then select the domain, then you uh, paste the text here. Jadi harus punya teksnya dulu. Yeah, then go proceed. I'm going to give you example using the sample text. So the title is United States. Here is a geography, not history. Then I type the text there. Okay, I put the text there. And I want to create some questions for my student. So I click proceed. Then I submit the content. After that, uh, I have to choose the keyword to help the AI. Yeah, I can add some more key keywords or I can reduce the keyword. I'm going to put more, for example, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, for example, and I'm going to drop DC. I don't want that. Okay. So this is the keyword. Then the AI will preview the content. They will do a review for the content. If this has happened like this, go skip review step. Kalau pakai review content anyway, then you have to pay. Okay? Yeah. And this is the questions. You got 57 question ideas. You got uh, WX question 17, interpretive questions 52. So you got more than 100 questions based on the text. Of course, you have to pick some. Again, this is AI. You have to choose some of them, not all of them. Okay? When you finish with this, then you can export the questions, okay? Or you can save it. When you export, kalau nanti kliknya yang Word, klik yang PDF, bayar. Kita cari yang gratis. Klik yang TXT aja. You click that, uh, then you save it. Then you save that. Okay, it's safe. Then I open that. Uh, so in the folder. Then I open. Wait a minute. Then I will have uh, the TXT that in my desktop. Just a second. What is it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, tapi kitulah kira-kira. Uh, I cannot find it in my desktop. Yeah. I can open it from here. Yeah, so you got the TXT here. You have a, a lot of questions that you have to choose from. Usually when you got a text, then you have to uh, formulate some questions will take time. With the Quillions, hopefully that will help you um, to um, use the time for other things not creating questions but maybe uh, later who should i address these questions and or other pedagogy aspects on that yeah okay that's uh william if you have any comment put in the chat box or you can use your mobile then uh, i will respond on that yeah 
Okay. Thank you very much. That's the um, quillions. So there are two that I introduced. There are more. Uh, lessonwriter.com and quillions.com that will help uh, you if you're teaching reading. Now, uh, let's we move on. Generating word cloud. If you are teaching using a lot of videos from YouTube, then you can go to skimthrough.ai. Then you will get a cloud of words, vocabulary that you have to introduce to your students before you watch the video. Kalau kita ngajar pakai uh, YouTube, biasanya kita nonton dulu vocabnya apa yang harus dikenalkan, mikir dulu, and that uh, takes a lot of time. Skip through, that will help you. What vocabulary that you can take from the video, so you go to skimthrough.ai, and then you choose the uh, 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 videos that you're going to use. Yeah. So that's uh, make our life a little bit easier. Then you can prepare the questions and so on and so on. Yeah, and that's uh, related to uh, video or YouTube. Another one, sometimes when we teach uh, using YouTube, then we need to chop the, the materials. Kalau YouTube-nya satu jam, then I'm going to use uh, only in the middle part. Then you watch for one hour and then you decide how to chop, you decide uh, and using a lot of software and so on and so on. The AI will help you. It's called typestudio.co. Yeah, I'm not going to show this uh, to you, but then you can explore it around. I give you the tutorial as well. So you will get the text. Yeah, there is a video and also the text. So you do not need to watch the video, look at the text, and then you can delete the text and then the video automatically will get shortened. Gitu ya? So you are not uh, listening minute by minute or second by second, but you just look at the text and then you highlight the text that you don't want it and then you erase that and that will automatically cut the video. Yeah, that's uh, transcribing that will help you. And then when you cut the transcribe text that they will cut the video automatically. Yeah, that's type Go Studio. Okay. Um, another one. Um, a lot of us have problem in teaching vocabulary, especially if you are teaching at a low level. Yeah, practice for vocabulary. Uh, there are a lot of chatbot. How many of you familiar uh, using chatbot? Sudah ada yang main-main dengan chatbot, please. Can you respond in the chat box or in your mobile in uh, Canva Live? Not yet? Not yet? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Chatbot. Um, I, I use that a lot to teach uh, teenagers because uh, they need to improve their vocabulary and they need to practice. Before speaking, they, use, they should have a lot of exposure and a friend to talk to, a friend to practice. Yeah. One way is using chatbots. I'm going to introduce you some and I'm going to show you just one. Uh, do the demo uh, for that. How many of you are uh, familiar with cookie? And the check box, please. Cookie. Cookie is one. Uh, very casual uh, and um, clever in um, making us typing more word. Yeah, I'm going to give you an example for that. I go to cookie.ai. Then uh, here, this is cookie. Uh, then I go to chat. Yeah, then uh, I need to log in using my Google. Okay. Then it's loading. Yeah. So it's a chatbot to improve the vocabulary. You can ask any questions. For example, I will say hi. 
Hi there, Jati. Recognize my name, uh, then hola, then mention other things, then I will say, how are you? How are you, for example? Then um, very quickly, I'm doing fine, thanks. And how are you? Great. Um, so I can have you sound in a good mood. This is another uh, example. If, if we talk to a friend, um, you sound in a good mood. Kayaknya nggak akan keluar kayak gitu deh. Ya, yeah? so there are a lot of variation or response from cookie that will improve the student's expression and um, also vocabulary. For example, if I'm asking um, cookie, how old are you? Right? Let's see what's the response. I'm 18 years old. How old are you? Then I'll say I'm 64. 64. Yeah, so I can continue practice my limited English with cookie and then I will gain more vocabulary. This is an example. Maybe it's good to introduce cookie to uh, your students if you are teaching in a semester one or maybe it's good for high school. Yeah, uh, or SMP probably. Okay, that's cookie. There are other chatbot that's more serious. Next one, it's called, um, I demo that. Next one, it's called uh, Replica. Yeah. Replica is uh, designed by uh, psychologists. It's good to practice. It will talk a lot about feeling. So if you are teaching, for example, vocabulary or reading text or watching video, that actually there's a lot of feelings. Then you can uh, ask your student to talk to replica. They will get uh, a lot of experience on that. Yeah. Uh, another one that you can try. This is also free. Is Effie. Effie is uh, they have a facial expressions uh, when interact. Uh, they can speak several languages, not only English. So if you are teaching Arabic, try to speak to Effie um, uh, in Arabic, and then they will uh, answer that as well. Yeah. Um, another one is Elsa. Maybe some of you familiar with Elsa. Elsa is very good for pronunciation for English. Very specifically, not vocabulary, but more on pronunciation in a very short dialogue. So it's good for semester one students on that. Yeah. Uh, it's again, it's freemium up to a certain level, uh, free, and uh, when it more advanced then you have to pay a little yeah use the free version on that okay that's uh, about speaking and also vocabulary yeah now my question what is the most time consuming in teaching writing can you respond that in the chat or you can respond using your mobile in a canva live please Time consuming when you're teaching writing. Correcting, Ibu Erma, thank you. Correcting essays. Other? Ada nggak kira-kira uh, software? Giving feedback, thank you. Yang bisa giving feedback dan juga uh, correcting. Grammarly, good. Grammarly is good. Ya, tapi ada yang lebih canggih dari Grammarly atau tidak? Oke, okay. okay. Ibu Siti um, Asmiah giving feedback. Good. Preparing the activities. That's Ibu Mila. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to give you some example of um, tools that we can use when we did writing. I'm using this uh, a lot with my students in ETB, non-English department, semester one students. I'm teaching uh, critical reading, but they have to write an essay at the end of the semester 
um, short essay, four paragraph, three paragraph, very short essay, uh, talking about a certain topic. Yeah, then I'm going, I'm using this uh, software a lot. Um, but then the AI only help the student with spelling, like, you know, uh, grammar, word choice, style, and vocabulary. But uh, the the way they argue, AI belum bisa. Yeah, how they structure the argument, the AI will not detect that yet. Yeah, but they work on word choice, grammar, spelling. So they will take some part of giving input to my students on the area of grammar, word choice, and maybe uh, style. Yeah. Now, um, essay board. How many of you familiar with essay board? Can you respond in the chat or in the Canva Live, please? No? Okay. Kalau tidak, then I'll explain more about essay board. Okay, essay board uh, will help the students getting ideas, only ideas. Jadi jangan uh, dipakai untuk uh, sampai menulis akhir essay board. I've tried that, it will not work. The essay is not very good, but that's useful for the students to get to know the topic. For example, if you give a topic to your students and the students say, well, sir, I don't know uh, that much about this topic. So how can, um, where should I go? And so on and so on. Yeah. So you can introduce essay pod. If you click essaypod.com, then um, they will, uh, this machine is uh, quite good in giving ideas. Yeah. So I can log in again, it's free. Then um, this is uh, because it's free, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, advertisement, yeah. So I create a new topics or a new essay, for example. Then, for example, I have to write something about, uh, for example, using AI uh, for teaching, uh, say, vocab vocabulary. Yeah, that's the topic. So I just click start writing. Then this robot will get, give me a lot of paragraph about using AI for teaching vocabulary. Okay. This is just to get the ideas. Supaya mahasiswanya atau siswanya familiar what's uh, available out there. Yeah. So they have to read uh, this paragraph so that they get ideas. Yeah. For example, if I'm taking this as a start, start with this, then um, this is helping me with uh, rewriting or rephrase the paragraph. Then I put the paragraph there. Okay. So this has become my reading. Yeah. The paragraph from uh, I have to move it around because of a uh, block by advertisement. But this is the paragraph. Uh, it's there. Yeah. Then if you look at here, you have a paragraph and more paragraph that we can choose. And also some uh, resources that we can uh, use here. There is a resources button uh, behind this. If I do this, yeah. More paragraph, I can click there. If I have a resources and citation, then I go, can go to resources and citation and I will have more paragraph. So this is to help the students to get ideas. Itu ya. Hanya untuk ideasnya saja. If they try to cut and paste, then the whole essay will be uh, unstructured. Yeah, you can try it later. And uh, you have to make it clear to your students that this is only giving you ideas. Okay, that's uh, as important. So usually, if I give a topic to my students, if they don't understand the topic, then I will say go to uh, essayport.com and uh, familiarize uh, with the topics. 
on that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, so that's um, the uh, essay part. If you have any comment, you can put in the chat box. Okay, I think uh, I yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, wait a second. I, I I think I got a hang over here. Uh, I stop share first. Yeah. Then I have to reshare. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I think I somehow. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Sorry for the trouble. Uh, sharing. Wait, wait. I still. Okay. I have to reshare my screen. I'm sorry for the trouble. And I'm getting back very soon. Okay. Yeah, so that's an essay part to give the students ideas. Then similar to uh, Grammarly, there are some others. Grammarly is very familiar with the students. You can ask the student to go to um, this, uh, to go to uh, this site. This is freemium, some part are free, some part uh, you have to pay. That's called uh, outright. It's very good for spelling and grammar, very similar to Grammarly. Or you can go through Pro Writing Aid. So uh, spelling, grammar, and style checking. They will check the style. They will give a lot of feedback about the style for free. Yeah. So you can advise your students to go to here. Yeah. The next one um, that I use a lot is paperwriter.com and virtual writing tutor. So I'm introducing this uh, with the student, if the student got confused with the, um, for example, not familiar with the topic, I will ask them to go to essaywriter.com, then um, go to Grammarly or Pro Writing A for the style. Then at the end, I ask them to go to paperwriter.com that will give a lot of inputs and virtualwritingtutor.com. I'm going to do a demo on virtualwriting.com with the feedback and also the scoring. So far, this is the best that I found. Maybe there are other that's are better, but uh, I found, um, or oh, I find this uh, very good. And I introduced this to my students. Yeah, How it works, for example, uh, I'm going to take the text from my student, semester one, non-English department. Yeah. Then I put it here. I paste it there. Then I click score essay. This is an opinion essay. And I check. I advise my students to talk to the AI before they submit their final tasks uh, to me, yeah. So this is the uh, opinion essay. The score is seventy-five. This is the statistic. The writing quality. There are a lot of advice. The essay structure. There are a lot of advice. Per paragraph. This is paragraph one. This is paragraph two. This is the third paragraph with a lot of advice. Yeah, and the conclusion. This is the vocabulary. So it's pretty good vocabulary that they use. The language accuracy and so on. So I said to my student, if you're happy with your score 73, then give your asset to me. If you are not happy, fix it and then um, give it to uh, virtual writing tutor, ask them to score or ask the tools to score your writing. If you're happy with that, and then you give it to me. So when I talk to my students, uh, it's already uh, fixed here at that, yeah? Hopefully that will make my life better and I enjoy more when I read my uh, 
students were. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, the AI for writing. Yeah. Now, there are tools available with the AI. If you use that correctly, the AI that's available, there are a lot of free AIs and you integrate that and to teach to your student and you use that will make your um, life easier. Yeah, in some ways. And you have to put that uh, in consideration. So AI has a potential benefit in education, improve the working life of the teachers and also enjoy uh, helping the students to enjoy the, their learning journeys. Yeah, thank you very much. If you want my slide, you can take a picture <laughs> here if you want to join our uh, Telegram group talking about technology and language teaching, you can go to uh, Telegram ITEL, bit.ly Telegram ITEL. If you want to get a free book, uh, written very practical tips written by uh, some friends from ITEL, you can go to bit.ly ITEL minus book minus one. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I give the time to Sefudin Pak for yes. Q&A if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Jati. <coughs> A lot of information that we get from Pak Jati's presentation today. Yes, it is really interesting always for me and I'm sure for many of us uh, when we talk about AI. Uh, so if I may uh say it in our own words so what is ai ai is a is a system actually is that correct Pak Ajit, yeah? it's a system yes. that will help us to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence yeah. uh, such as uh, visual perception speech recognition and decision making in eventually yeah. so the the system helped us to do that and we have been working with it with this ai actually but yeah <coughs> today we are very much enlightened by pak jati especially uh, those ais that are useful for us when we are doing the teaching learning activities language teaching learning activities. Bapak-Ibu sekalian yang saya hormati, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you may raise your hand in, uh, if for those who are on Zoom, you may raise your hand and for those who are present here in this room, you may just shout or raise your hand. Any questions? Yes. Uh, one okay one any other yeah pass uh, one uh, pa and puramiza yes silakan monggo pak silakan pak bismillahirrahmanirrahim assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Despite uh, I'm a bit late to join your presentation, maybe only 15% I could cover uh, the whole presentation that you have presented today. But to my view, and I would like to give my comments that this is a great presentation from Professor Gumiwan and I'm enlightened uh, relating to teaching English with technology. Today there is no doubt that uh, a lot of changes happened due to pandemic COVID-19. So in all aspects of teaching English has already transformed to full online learning and hybrid learning at the same time. 
But I'm afraid the position of teacher could be marginal from time to time if we don't adapt ourselves to technology. And I'm afraid uh, the position of teacher is no longer needed in the classroom in the future. So what we need to do, I think we have a very big homework ahead uh, facing the pace of technology, which uh, we can see from different platforms, different providers. Even now, it is very well known Ruang Guru in Indonesia has already places all the position of teachers, although teachers still need uh, to adapt themselves. But I'm afraid in the future, maybe 20 or 25 years ahead, the position of, of teacher is no longer in need uh, to be in the classroom. Maybe if that happened, uh, what we need to do to get ready for that? This is first question. The second question, that today, uh, being a lecturer of, uh, being lecturers of English, also will be the same. Maybe in the future, we only need to uh, distribute our knowledge or distribute our, disseminate our knowledge uh, regarding uh, a good teaching of English through papers, articles, so we don't need to go and face to face in the front of the classroom like we have today. So we need no, we no longer need to have a big university, big room like we have this amphitheater. We spend a lot of money to build billions, but we are not in need of it because in the small room, two by two uh, size is enough for us to spread our knowledge, spread our uh, understanding about ELT, for example, through that room. So what is the point to have this big university? You have nine story building. At the end of the day, we don't need. So what is your opinion? I think that's my question. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. <coughs> okay, I uh, thank you very much for the question. That's a very good question. Um, are we needed in the next 20 years or in the next three years? Uh, amphitheater with the big rooms are needed in the university. That's always the, the big questions on that. But let me give you an um, analogy about the changes. The changes is not only for teachers. The changes is for everyone around the globe, not only in Indonesian context. It's everywhere. If we don't have a mobile phone with enough data, what will happen? I cannot order taxi. I cannot uh, go to go food. I cannot transfer money. I cannot uh, with the Paduli Nindumi. Then I cannot uh, enter a supermarket or a big mall and so on and so on. Meaning, everything changes. The way we live day to day changes. The question is, do I change the way I teach? or I teach the same things over 10 years. On the last 10 years, I just do the same thing, business as usual, yeah? Of course, then we have to change. The question is how? That's another, another issue, yeah? But the point is, uh, everything changes, everyone changes because of the network, because of the internet. Everything has pattern, Everything can be programmed, they're going to be programmed and they're going to be put in pattern and they're going to be uh, given it to AI. Uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, soon metaverse. Itu urusan, urusan yang lain, tapi dengan AI, uh, that will change a lot. Yeah. Will we be replaced 
I don't think so. Some part of our job will be replaced. We have a copay, we have dana, we have other things. Persons who live uh, or work in the bank, will they be replaced? No. But the customer service maybe will be replaced, but not the whole bank. Yeah, so think about that. AI will take some part of our job, but not the whole part. The human, the senses, uh, and so on, they will stay with us. Yeah, so uh, don't be afraid of being replaced by a robot, but uh, please be aware of the robot and make friends with the robot. Work hand in hand with the robot so that you can become a better teacher for the next generation. That's what I can say and respond for uh, the first question. The second question says more on the changing of uh, uh, what we have right now. You mentioned a lot of university. Universities uh, changes very slow. Not only in Indonesia, around the globe. Yeah, when you're talking to lecturers, you're talking to researchers in the university, the changing will get a lot slower compared to company. The company changing very quick. They appear very quick, they diminish and finish very quick. Yeah, because the business, the nature of the business is, is different. Of course, uh, before the COVID, for example, how many of universities put their learning resources in the learning management system, on campus learning management system? Very few, even in my campus. Yeah. Tidak semua dosen naruh materinya di LMS. Because, ya ngapain? I will meet them tomorrow, why should I? And so on. I can keep this in a printed material and so on. Yeah. There is no urgency. COVID-19 changed everything. No face to face. Now everything should be digital. And then, can we do it? Yes. Panic for the first three months. And then the rest, we evolve slowly. Yeah. So the university, the education will evolve, but will evolve slowly or slower compared to a business. That's what I can respond uh, to that. Questions. Back to you, Pa Saibuddin. Uh, thank you, Pak Jati. So, Pa, siapa, Pak? Pak Ruslin. Yes, thank you, Pak Ruslin. So, and the next question, Pak, uh, from Pak Ibu... Ruslin, I think you are muted. I cannot hear you. Hello? Can you hear me, Pak? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Thank you, Pak. I'm speaking from. I'm using my mobile phone now. Okay, good. So, uh, this is another question uh, that will be by Ibu Ramiza from UPM, Malaysia. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Ramisa. Okay, Assalamualaikum. I oh. cannot hear you now. Oh, cannot. Can you hear me now, Dr. Jati? Can anyone hear Ibu Ramisa then? Maybe you can uh, reformulate the questions for me. Uh, I think the technician, uh, the technical committee is looking into it. Okay, can. All right. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Jati? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, Dr. Saya, uh, I am Ramiza Darmi from University of Putra, Malaysia. Okay, I have two questions. Number one Hello. is about the Queen Lions, Queen Leons, is it? 
Alright. Or maybe you can type it uh, if you are in the Zoom. Maybe you can type your question in the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Or you can type in. Uh, well, I finish sharing the uh, screen. Mm -hmm. Hello. I cannot. I cannot hear the questions, uh, Saifuddin. Yes, ma. We are dealing with this problem. Problem. Is Ibu Ramisa in the room or? Yes, yes, in the room. Yeah, just uh, go. You go to her and then use your mobile. <laughs> That's better. <ma. laughs> you walk to her. <laughs> Approach her, and then uh, you can use the mobile. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, and that's in the chat room. Quillions, if I design my reading text, can I get questions using Quillions? Yes, you can. So you just put the title, and then you paste, uh, you copy and paste your text there, and then you follow the steps. Yeah, so you paste it there and then uh, okay. Okay. follow the steps. Uh, Dr. Jati, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Fine, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jati. Okay, um, I got the questions, I think, uh, in my chat. Uh, in the my chat box yeah about quillions the question is yes if I, if I design my reading text can I get questions using quillions yes 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 the answer is uh, yes simply you uh, just fill in the title then you paste the text, your own text there, and then uh, you follow the step, and then you will get a questions. So that's the point of uh, Quillian. So you can use your own text, and then the AI will help uh, creating uh, the questions from the text. Is that uh, answering your question, Ibu Ramisa? Yes, but okay. Thank you. Can you hear me, Pak? Hello, Pak Jati. Yes, hello, Pak. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Pak Jati, my second question is in regards to um, reading aloud. All right. Uh, there was one instance I tried to apply for a research grant whereby I wanted to design storybook, uh, storybooks for children. But I also plan to integrate QRs into one if uh, together with the book okay and then yeah. when i was uh, questioned by the panel of interviewers so one of them were the uh, was the professor from the faculty of computer uh, science and technology uh, the other was uh, a, doc uh, a professor also but from the english department uh, the professor from computer uh, did not agree because according to her, nowadays, uh, even little children read from handphone. 
but my argument was that I want uh, uh, the the purpose of the uh, a storybook is actually to inculcate the love of reading, not to uh, be you know not to use the, to use the phone hundred percent, especially among the children. So because of that, I did not. Uh, I mean, I failed to get that grant to come up with the storybook embed with uh, technology or uh, simple uh, SQRs. So what is your advice? Yeah, do you also have the opinion that storybook reading, that is the form, uh, the, the storybook in the form of physical, is no longer relevant in this current generation? All right, thank you. Um, okay, thank, thank you, Ibu. Um, that's a very interesting and um, good, very good question. Uh, about storybook, I still agree and believe the storybook in the form of printed up to this time is still relevant. And um, mobile phone, I agree with you for uh, teenage and younger generation for SD and SMP that level for K-12, I think should be controlled by the uh, parents. Yeah. And paper or maybe tablet accompanied by the parents, they are still uh, crucial. Now, in response to your questions, uh, most of the people or most of the uh, people out there, that's not in the education sector, special language, if they are the computer and so on and so on, they um, try to look at things from business side. Business, of course, Digital is easier, digital is cheaper, and so on and so on. For us, yes, it will be easier, but it needs time. The teachers, the parents to accompany their kid and looking at their mobile phone and so on. It should be um, careful, carefully trained for the parents. So I agree with you that QR in a form of paper, that's very good. Or if you can put it in a form of a uh, tablet, but not in a mobile version, maybe that's better. But with the note, it should be accompanied by parents. That's my opinion. Yeah. So sorry to hear that uh, your grant was not uh, granted. It, it's, I think it's, it's a good, good idea to put a lot of QR so that um, the student or the kid, they got the model of the pronunciation and so on and so on. Yeah. Or maybe in the QR itself, the questions from the text. I think you should get another grant, Ibu. Yeah, if that's granted, that will be a great contribution for the education, especially for reading. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pak Jati. Uh, I'm sure that last question completes this session. Uh, in this last meeting, I would like to say a few things. The first is, uh, well, actually moving from paper to pixel is not easy. It surely takes time, yes. It needs times to adapt, but certainly we will do that adaptation. Old does not mean left behind. Sometimes we learn from the past, we learn from the old things, and that's what we are doing at the moment. Although we use uh, digital pen, but we still use digital-like screen, eh, paper-like screen. So, well, we cannot leave what we have been experiencing in the past. We will just need to make some adaptation. For me, myself, I will be uh, more, uh, I, I, I will, I, I, I mean, I'm much more interested in how those technologies are used in the classrooms, and that is our homework, actually, and how we, how, uh, what kind of scenario that the technologies that has been introduced by uh, Pak Jati this morning uh, in our classroom. How we, what scenario actually that we can do to integrate those technologies in the classroom? That is 
our homework and that requires uh, more time to think of and that will also require training I'm sure and that is yeah, part of yeah. our job in the teacher training college but Jati, thank you uh, for the presentation today and surely we will meet again in the future insyaallah and for me as moderator uh, just in case just if there anything which is not appropriate uh, mohon maaf yang sebesar-besarnya terima kasih much. Pak Jati uh, yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much everyone. Been uh, glad to see you here. Uh, I hope that you do uh, explore and do research in the area, the area of AI, VR still open. Uh, still a lot of holes that we have to fill in with research. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak Jati. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, Bapak Ibu semuanya sebelum kita melanjutkan ke sesi uh, berikutnya Sesi berikutnya dengan Ibu Ramiza uh, Bapak Ibu bisa break sebentar 10 menit Monggo silakan ambil uh, cover break di luar amphitheater Thank you
Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly enter the room because the conference is about to continue with our next speaker. Once again, please kindly enter the room because the conference is about to continue with our next speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly enter the room because the conference is about to continue with our next speaker.
Welcome back to the third international conference on English language teaching iConnect 2022. We also thank you for the remarkable support from National Tonghua University, our partner journals, Indonesia Journal of Open Education or IGEE, Okara, Nobel, Indonesian Journal of English Teaching or IJET, Pioneer Journal, Panyonara, English Education Journal, Ealing Journal, Foster Journal, Elite Journal, Bastra, Journal of Language Intelligence and Culture, University of NU Surabaya, Bank Tabungan Negara, and Nitiyasa. Okay, for the next session, we will have uh, Dr. Dr. Ram Ramiza Darmi with the theme innovation, innovation in language teaching, possibility and opportunity.